Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I always love when people are like, yes, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I so appreciate it because sometimes the energy is like, it, it's important to have it. And we're talking about a very interesting topic today. Um, we're talking about the practicing of harm reduction with mandated or justice involved clients, okay? Because folks are using different, different terminology while we're making the shift to go to justice involved, still that, that mandating feels very generalized. So I wanted to make sure that I was inclusive of everyone in the terminology that they may be using. My name is Dr. Dolores Blackwell, and I am with you today to present this webinar. And this is actually something that I've talked about in prior occasions in the larger OASIS harm reduction office hours. So hopefully um, some folks will definitely get some information from this. And it really is thinking about our work with justice involved clients and how we're, you know, how to connect that harm reduction approach, okay? And it is something that folks continue to uh, continue to be challenged by because we know that there still continues to be a great deal of stigma around harm reduction, right? Around harm reduction, even though it is evidence-based and even though there's a great deal of research out there that it is effective, um, there still continues to be some challenges around folks actually integrating harm reduction into their practices. And particularly when we're talking about justice involved clients and when we involve probation, parole, the courts, et cetera. While today we'll be focusing on justice involved clients, that does not mean that this does not apply for other folks who may be mandated to treatment through ACS, employers, et cetera. So this is something that you can can potentially apply across the board. So before we get started, I am going to give you some housekeeping information. Um, I'm going to ask for each person to please turn on their cameras if they can. Do realize that people are in different places and different spaces. And so definitely being a part of, you know, having your, your camera on is definitely something that's extremely helpful. I introduced who I was and oh, I do need to say a couple of things in regards to the slides. You will receive a copy of the slides along with your certificate of completion. So you don't have to feel like you are locked and loaded and have to check out the slides and have to see the slides. And honestly, a lot of the material I may be talking about goes beyond the slides. And so you can definitely just kind of stay present and be in tune with the information that's going to be presented. Um, we will be together for approximately two hours today. So hopefully this is an opportunity for you to either learn or to expand your learning around harm reduction working with justice involved clients. Before I move to my slide deck, I'd like to give everyone an opportunity to open up their mic and just say good morning. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. 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 Thank you. And I bet you there's people here who are in this training space who haven't seen each other for a while. So you can definitely feel free to say hello to folks in the chat. And the chat is also a community chat, okay? So the chat is not just about responding to me or about the audio or visual and anything. It's also the sharing of resources. It's also connecting to each other. It's also just kind of, you know, sharing your thoughts, et cetera. So please feel free to use the chat in that way, okay? So our training or our webinar today is Practicing Harm Reduction with Justice Involved Clients. And as I indicated to you, my name is Dr. Dolores Blackwell. I'm a licensed clinical social worker here in New York and in a number of other places. And I am a firm harm reductionist. I'm a firm harm reductionist. I would suggest at any given time or any, any time you have available, if you have an opportunity to participate in the um, OASIS harm reduction office hours, it's an amazing opportunity to share information, share resources, to hear information, et cetera, and resources as it relates to uh -huh. harm reduction. Okay, so let me get myself sorted out. 
Okay, and so just acknowledging that this um, presentation is prepared by the Northeast and Caribbean Addiction Technology Transfer Center or ATTC. It is an amazing opportunity and it is an amazing resource for you to utilize to gather all sorts of training information or access to training information, to check in around training, availability of training, et cetera. And so it is an amazing resource that you definitely should be utilizing. The Northeast and Caribbean Addiction um, Technology Transfer Center covers New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And unfortunately, I have not had a chance to go to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, but I'm hoping that when it gets really cold, the call will come. Okay, so I'm hoping that. Um, at the time, um, just kind of thinking about that this information um, oh, does not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA or anyone else. This is purely information that is disseminated and connected to the Northeast and Caribbean Addiction Technology Transfer Center. The other thing I wanted to mention is that language matters. And so the ATTC really does use affirming language to promote the promises of recovery by advancing evidence-based and culturally informed practices. And this is one of those practices today, harm reduction, okay? So at the end of the session, you will complete an online evaluation and the instructions are below. Um, you'll have an opportunity to complete that and certificates will be sent out within a week along with a copy of the slide deck. This particular training is approved by OASIS for two hours of KSAC credentialing hours. And in order to get your certificate of completion, you must attend the entire session. And so part of that is the reason why we ask for you to type your name and um, organization within the chat. And we talked about that, right? So what I'm going to ask is thinking about harm reduction, right? Just, just kind of putting yourself in this space. So not stand, but Please raise your hand if you've ever attempted to reduce use of sugar, alcohol, cigarettes, or any other product. Mm, I'm seeing quite a few hand raise. Okay, quite a few hand raises. Okay. Are you familiar with that you are all actually practicing harm reduction? I'm seeing folks saying yes. Yeah, you're actually practicing harm reduction. And so when we think about the premise of harm reduction and we think about folk having some challenges around harm reduction and what that means, in many ways, folks have connected harm reduction to substance use, but we're all practicing harm reduction every day. If we use seat belts, we're practicing harm reduction. If we are decreasing sugar, we're practicing harm reduction. Any of those things, all of those things are connected to harm reduction, okay? All of them are connected to harm reduction. And so I wanted to get a sense for people, you know, to share an opportunity of what are their thoughts about harm reduction? What are some of the things they've heard what are some of their, their own considerations when they think about harm reduction? And I wanted to open it up and give people that space because everybody has thoughts about harm reduction, particularly in the practice and working with folks who are challenged by substance use and who are involved in the justice system. And you can feel free to unmute yourself or place it in the chat. Okay, so we've got some folks placing things in the chat. Um, let me make sure. Ah, wow. So someone said, how can you be practicing harm reduction when you can't reduce your own addictions? Oof. Wow, okay, we started with the heavy guns right now. Okay, what else do we have here? 
um, is useful for counseling where clients don't feel judged. Okay, good, good. Other thoughts? Hi, I'll just, uh, my name's Elisa Schneider. And um, so in the courts, if somebody returns as a reoccurrence to use, there isn't an automatic jail sanction or, you know, some kind of punishment that it's something where we say, you know, um, all right, let's let's look on this instead of being punitive. Let's talk about that. So that's something that's changed in the courts over the years um, where we're not automatically you go to jail. So that's harm reduction, um, giving some freedom to understand reoccurrence to use or return to use. And absolutely, thank you for that. There has been movement of the needle in regards to harm reduction in the courts. I think um, prosecutors, defense attorneys, of course, are definitely more open to harm reduction. I think the one population, depending upon where you land, that continues to have some challenges around harm reduction are the judges, okay? And so really a lot of attention, a lot of time and focus needs to be put on really shifting some of that mindset for some of the judges. But we do have opioid courts located here in the state of New York that are doing amazing work in regards to harm reduction and are framing much of their work around harm reduction. And there is an, definitely an increased openness to harm reduction and the recognizing, and you know, the recognition that not everyone is in that space of abstinence. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, I also see, sorry to lean my head down, um, there's folks, I believe we do practice harm reduction in just about everything we do in life, and you can practice harm reduction in every aspect of your life. Absolutely. Um, Shelly is mentioning that there's more of a collaborative approach um, in that it's, it's for them, not against them. So it definitely is within the context of person-centered approach, person-centered thinking, meeting people where they are, whether where they ever they are along the harm reduction spectrum. And we're going to talk about that in a few. Um, we also have folks don't feel judged, etc. Okay, so definitely some great comments in the chat. Was there anyone else who wanted to um, open up the mic to, or open up their um, mic to say something um, verbally? about harm reduction. So let me just make this larger. And so when we think about harm reduction, harm reduction is a set of policies or programs that allow individual to mitigate the risk associated with particular behaviors. And that expands the conversation around harm reduction and really lends itself to, it can be applied in regards to drugs, alcohol, tobacco, sex, any challenging behavior that folks would like to make some changes around, any challenging behavior that folks would like to make changes around. Um, these changes could include decreasing the impact on their daily lives, um, decreasing the impact on their health, et cetera. And at its foundation, harm reduction recognizes that strategies that emphasize abstinence or behavior avoidance may work for some folks, but for other folks, it may be ineffective. And so we really need to lean into the fact that harm reduction responds or respects to human, you know, respects both human rights and personal autonomy alongside access with tools such as condoms, alternative product, um, products such as Suboxone, et cetera, that help people stay safe. Now, while we recognize that harm reduction is in tune with human rights, with dignity, with choice, et cetera, we also have to take into consideration that folks who are involved in the justice system in one way or capacity, whether it's the courts, probation and parole, may feel as if their autonomy is not respected because they involve, they may be involved in systems or may be treated in a way and by those systems that may not feel like their autonomy and their ability to choose is respected. And that's something that we have to deal with in the room, okay? We can't ignore that concept. And so when we're talking with folks who are involved in justice, um, the justice system in a variety of different ways and places, et cetera, when engaging in that, 
that initial alliance, building that alliance, we need to address that and potentially be open to the negative um, emotions that are connected to that. Okay, because regardless as to whether or not someone comes through the opioid courts, a parole, probation, etc., there's something that feels very raw and very vulnerable and is challenging to be told that this is your choice, treatment or not. Okay, or to be told by a parole officer or probation officer, you know what, you're going to treatment. Okay, so we need to address that elephant in the, room, in the room, in the initial phases in treatment, and also as we continue along in treatment as well, okay? So harm reduction myths and who says? So harm reduction is only for people who use drugs. The fact is it applies to a multitude of different behaviors and we talked about that, okay? And it seems as if everyone, including myself, is practicing harm reduction in one way, shape, or form. Harm reduction normalizes, encourages, or enables, enables risky behavior. Actually, harm reduction has no judgment at all on any of the behaviors, okay? But that doesn't mean that, you know, harm reductionists or folks who are engaging in harm reduction care are encouraging risky behaviors. Okay, or risky decisions. What we're doing is we're acknowledging the very real harms associated with risky behaviors. And we don't try to minimize the impact of them, but we do not encourage anyone in one way, shape, form, or another because we are respecting people where they are. If they are in abstinence, we respect that. If they're engaged in safer use, we respect that as well. And that's one of those myths that we sometimes have to really deconstruct for folks in the community because there are some folks who believe that harm reduction encourages risky behavior, okay? Harm reduction prevents or opposes recovery or complete cessation by simply replacing one addiction with another. This is something that also we need to think about deconstructing in the community, because when we talk about the use of methadone, Suboxone, Vivitrol, et cetera, these are things that can help folks in their journey along any changes that they would like to make in regards to their substance or alcohol use, et cetera, but that is not replacing one addiction with another. Okay, harm reduction does not have that within the lexicon, within the language, okay? Any questions about any of that? Okay. So let's continue to lean in. So let's talk about some of the core concepts of harm reduction. And again, this may be a review for some folk and some folks, this may be entirely new information and that is okay either way. So I always like to show this particular, um, you know, visual because it, we're talking about the tree of addictions, right? The tree of addictions and the roots of addictions and addictions, period. There are so many components when we're talking about addiction, so many components when we're talking about substance use that we need to acknowledge all of the impact of these potential roots of addiction. So we could be talking about physical abuse. We could be talking about spiritual, spiritual abuse, sexual abuse, trauma, um, poverty, the social determinants of health, biopsychosocial stressors, the multiple biopsychosocial stressors that folks experience that may engage, may lead to folks potentially engaging in substance use. Many of these also have direct impact or some sort of impact on folks engaging in justice involved behavior. So we need to acknowledge the full tree, okay? We can't just focus on just one. And so when we talk about harm reduction, we're also leaning into the multiple biopsychosocial stressors that folks come to the table with. So the core concepts of harm reduction we really recognize and understand that drug use is a complex, multifaceted phenomenon that encompass, encompasses a continuum of behaviors. So we have folks who may be engaged in severe use to total abstinence and acknowledge that some ways of using drugs are just clearly safer than others. 
It really, harm reduction calls for non-judgmental, non-coercive provision of services and resources to people who use drugs and the communities in which they live in order to assist them in reducing attendant harm. It also recognizes, as we talked about in the use of the visual, recognizes the realities of poverty, class, racism, social isolation, social isolation, and other social inequities that affect both people's vulnerability and capacity to effectively deal with drug-related harm. And it does not attempt to minimize or ignore the real and tragic harm and danger that can be associated with illicit drug use. And again, some of this material are things that you can utilize as you're providing psychoeducation to justice involved folk. So it's not just educating justice involved folks around what harm reduction is or isn't, because we also need to have that component as well when we're working with folk. But we also need to begin to share this information with specific probation, parole, et cetera. And when we talk about providing treatment, really providing context of what harm reduction is so that we can deconstruct the stigma that surrounds harm reduction. So people in general are ambivalent about change and all change contains an element of ambivalence. We know this, right? And so people who use substances may continue their substance use because of their ambivalence. And resolving the ambivalence, which sounds very much like uh, the, the, the kind of connection to motivational interviewing in the direction of change is key, is the key to motivating individuals to make a change. And motivation to change can be fought by creating an accepting and empowering safe atmosphere to address substance use. That non-judgmental space that is respecting of and accepting of what is happening for folks, meeting them where they are, and providing them unconditional positive regard and congruence are key factors in really leaning into harm reduction and creating a space for substance use treatment that is respectful of folks' autonomy. So when we talk about harm reduction, we cannot, we cannot kind of lean into harm reduction without leaning into the treatment spectrum, right? The treatment spectrum. While we, in many ways, for years, have focused on abstinence, and many programs do focus on abstinence and continue to, okay, and justice-involved folk may be involved with systems such as probation and parole that push abstinence, right, no use, et cetera, when we talk with probation, parole, courts, et cetera, and individual folks, really leaning into the spectrum of harm reduction is a great way of deconstructing some stigma around it, okay? So we have abstinence, which is on one end of the spectrum, reduction of risk, where folks are actively reducing risky, challenging behavior, okay? And that's a planned action, and also safer practice, such as syringe, syringe exchange sites, et cetera. These are all a part of the harm reduction spectrum, okay? And so when we're educating folks around that, including our clients, really leaning into using something like this or a visual like this is incredibly helpful, okay? Any questions about any of this? I just wanna make sure I'm creating space. Okay. So when we talk about harm reduction, the treatment tax, right? We've leaned into building and managing a non-judgmental and empathic and healing therapeutic alliance with the client and leaning into the ambivalence. When we talk about the alliance, the alliance is not just the bond, which is the relationship or the engagement that we have with clients. We're also focusing on the goals and the tasks involved in that. So a full, robust therapeutic alliance is the combination of the goals that we're working on together collaboratively, the tasks that are working on, we're working on collaboratively, and also the relationship. That's the full kind of robustness of the therapeutic alliance. And so leaning into that and leaning into the ambivalence along the way is an important part of the treatment tasks. 
The identification, identification of goals along the harm reduction spectrum is also something that we are engaging in. And so when we're talking about harm reduction, not necessarily making the assumption that clients or folks understand what harm reduction is. So I always like that visual, using that visual and really leaning into asking folks, where do they think they fall along that visual? OK, even if they are involved in the justice system, right, even if they're involved in justice, um, such as probation, parole, the courts, etc., really leaning into and providing that autonomy around the harm reduction spectrum. OK, we do understand that some folks may come with a particular mandate or requirement that they are to abstain. And that's where we're going to have to go into that advocacy with um, justice involved partners. OK, and I'm using the word partners very specifically because in many ways we may think about these systems as separate from us. But if we work collaboratively with these spaces, if we work collaboratively with folks, probation officers and parole officers, of course, with the client's permission, right, with their permission, it helps to reduce some of that that kind of that kind of challenging and that kind of um, contradictory messaging. It also enhances or enhancing or enhancing the client self management skills are also one of the treatment tasks that we want to pay attention to, and really personalizing a person centered plan for positive changes. Okay, when we talk about harm reduction, we are also talking about person centered planning. OK, and what does that mean and what does that look like? OK, so it is a very thoughtful kind of measured way of providing treatment to our clientele. So harm reduction strategies may be inclusive of harm reduction strategies to decrease infections such as HIV, etc. So sterile syringes for safer injecting, PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylactics, PEP, which is post-exposure prophylactics, and safer sex supplies, such as condoms, okay? We also have harm reduction strategies that are specifically looking at engaging or increasing engagement, okay? So peer recovery supports are also an important part of this process, okay? Case managers, motivational interviewing, which we've injected in when we talk about ambivalence and open-ended questions, et cetera, and open access to services, a multitude of services, because we know that folks who are engaged potentially in substance use have services that they may need on multiple levels. So it may not be just about, I am here to meet the conditions of my mandate, okay? It's about what can we do to work together to help to improve your overall quality of life? That can include stable housing, that can include vocation, et cetera, vocational work, employment, training, school, et cetera. And so all of that is also a part of this complement of services that we can open access to and will also increase engagement. Some harm reduction strategies to decrease overdose, which we know we are in the middle and can, actually we're not in the middle, we continue to be in an overdose epidemic, okay? An overdose epidemic. So really leaning into overdose prevention and intervention education on an ongoing consistent way or basis. The use of medications to address opioid use disorders, an overdose safety plan, okay? An overdose safety plan. In the last few years, OASIS has asked that everyone who has a history of prior overdose or may be at risk for overdose has a safety plan in place, okay? Has a safety plan in place. And so that is a part of harm reduction, that overdose safety plan. Overdose prevention centers and absolutely the availability of fentanyl test strips and Narcan training. OK, and Narcan training being offered on an ongoing basis to not just clients, but also their families. OK. So harm reduction with justice involved clients. OK, let's move into some of the practicalities of this. OK. So before I go there, I wanted to stop my share for a second and open space for 
folks who have had some experience with justice involved clients and how that has looked in regards to harm reduction. And please feel free to enter information in the chat and or open your mic. Yes, anything that's in the slide deck, you can absolutely use. I see someone likes my um, visual, so absolutely you can use it. Does anyone have any examples of when they've attempted to work around in the context of harm reduction with a parole officer or probation officer and what that's looked like? I can say that I've used that diagram um, several times in group with my um, substance abuse clients. And I just basically start with, I draw the tree and I let them start putting things that affects them. And I try to get them to start from the root. It's always about the root of what start everything. And it's, they find it amazing. I find it amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. Has anyone um, had conversations with parole officers or probation officers around harm reduction? Yeah, so my name's Ben D. I work, uh in the Saratoga County Jail. Um, my entire life revolves around advocacy, um, harm reduction, forward motion and corrections. Um, they're actually pretty, so the culture, the culture here in Saratoga is kind of changing. Um, the less is more act really helped with that, um, where they're no longer giving technicals for, for use, things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly advocating that, um, progress and change looks different for different people and that an individual with a lengthy criminal history that has reduced use or is no longer using their problematic substance, um, that's forward motion and success for them. Um, you know, in this environment, autonomy is almost like non-existent in the jail environment. Um, so it's kind of, I've taken that on as their advocate to make sure that they had access to, to MAT, access to fentanyl test strips, Narcan, um, that they have appointments leaving and insurance and bus passes and everything that, because harm reduction is much broader than just use. I mean, I look at it as the entire individual and what their barriers are going to be. Um, so the parole and probation officers actually have a meeting coming up this week to explain to them that the programs were running in-house um, how that's helping individuals, what we're doing to make sure that they have a, a, long, a softer landing pad when they leave here. Um, and that not everyone is going to be in a position where they're going to be abstinent. And, and these are the things we're giving them to make sure they're safe. And um, so, yeah, those conversations, even with the judges, the amount of uh, alternative to incarceration um, that's being allowed for bed to beds instead of prison sentences has skyrocketed in this in this county especially. So I think the culture is changing. It's gonna take time. Um, the court system and the, and the correction system is a dinosaur, right? It's a punitive dinosaur that uh, uh, as newer people come in with, with different concepts and ideas, I think that will help uh, along with some training change that culture. Absolutely, and, the, and you've hit the nail right on the head the culture, okay, recognizing the culture, recognizing that it is going to take time to change. We also need to recognize the impact of the community on this, right? Because the community wants, and you can fill in the blanks. And so community jails, judges, et cetera, respond to the community needs as well. Um, also the education piece, the training piece. It's not just about handing someone a flyer or you know, having that one conversation. It's about a consistent effort to reframe the thinking around harm reduction and where people fall around that. Um, and also, you know, depending on where you're landing, some folks are working in the jail, some folks are working 
um, in the community with justice involved individuals, et cetera. And that also has a little bit of leeway too, because you can see a little bit of change in spaces outside of the correctional space. Um, the correction is going to take a little bit longer because we know that corrections is about control, right? Control. That's it. Control. And, you know, in recent years, we've seen some significant changes in regards to the programming being offered, et cetera. So we need to take in all of that into consideration. So um, before I move on to, I think it is uh, Tanisha, I wanted to ask if you would do a little bit of a concise explanation of what less is more of, is about because some folks in the space may not be familiar with what that is. Sure. So the less is more act um, has removed um, has removed punishments for technical violations, which would be like curfew violations, um, positive urine drug screens, um, you know, failure to comply with your outpatient. So the idea behind that was that parole was was really um, reincarcerating individuals that were struggling with substance use disorder, um, and we're not giving them the space uh, or the support to allow them to get into treatment to utilize other options. Um, and it has really it has really made an impact for individuals on their growth, in my opinion, um, their access to services. The parole officers went from showing up and handcuffing people to connecting them to resources um, and, and giving them much less sentences um, for, for parole violations. It was a major game changer, major game changer. So if folks are not familiar with it, it's been in around about two years now. Um, and so if you're not familiar with it, definitely utilize it. Um, when I've when it first came out, I used, utilized it with clients and really educated them around what it meant. And so it was super, super helpful. And you saw a number of individuals who were actually released from parole um, early because of it. OK, so thank you for that. Um, Tanisha, I definitely wanted to give space to you as well. And then I see that Elizabeth, you also have your hand up. So I'm going to get to you as well. Tanisha? Yes. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning again, everybody. Um, so I work with John, uh, John Jay College, and we are a, an arm uh, within the CUNY system to assist those that have been harmed by the justice system directly and indirectly. And one of the things that we uh, did do is um, we had a reentry simulation. So I don't know if anyone has had an opportunity to actually have that at your agency or attend one. Um, and so we uh, did this simulation, which actually invites uh, other providers to, to come in and be a part of an opportunity to experience what um, those, um, once they're released back to the community, what those barriers look like. And so we had these tables set up and each table represented a different system. And so we also invited the reentry managers, some of parole, some of probation, a variety of different uh, uh, partner agencies. Um, and it was uh, such a success. Um, and because when you decide to participate in the reentry simulation, you yourself become a justice impacted person that's just being released to the community. And so each person has a packet. Some people will have a packet that will include a quote unquote Metro card. Some will not. Some people will have uh, a birth certificate. Some will not. Um, so you see a long line always at the table for people to get those documents, right? I uh, participated and was the lady for the public assistance uh, line. I wanted to make sure I was as rude as possible. <laughs> we and then we would um, we would take a break come back and have a discussion about it, which when you take about a 10 minute break 
from the simulation and everyone comes back into the main room and we will have a conversation about what they were experiencing at the very end. And we did that break probably about three times, which each break represented a day, right? For a person to come back in and, and try again. And then at the very end, we had a panel discussion and I can tell you it was really uh, liberating to hear other people say, how they're going to go back to their agencies and people within the criminal justice system that work in those systems actually be moved to uh, speaking about change. And I think that was a great way when we talk about reducing harm, because I've always having conversations with uh, those in those spaces. Uh, prior to coming to John Jay, I worked with uh, the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, and it's such a change from working within this system and then coming to work in, in CUNY, much easier <laughs> from, from this end. So just wanted to add that. Thank you for that. And the interesting thing is, is that when you think about the different, like let's say you're here in the city, for example, the difference of the thinking around the Brooklyn DA's office versus the Manhattan DA's office, et cetera, are also things that we need to consider as well. Um, so, Definitely a lot of great information there. Elizabeth, definitely want to give you space. Thank you. I'll be brief. I just wanted to uh, answer your original question. Um, on, I work in um, Nassau County. So I work with the Nassau County Courts. I work with um, Felony Treatment Court, um, sometimes Suffolk County, Queens, sometimes rarely Manhattan, but yes, they are um, absolutely 100% open to harm reduction as far as the patients that I treat, the ones that are on probation and parole. Uh, it's great. It really is. It, it offers my patients, like I said a little earlier, um, the ability to have a life, to hold down a job, have, you know, have a family, socialize, and still be protected. And yes, we have at my office, we have uh, fentanyl test strips that we train the patients how to use. Uh, Narcan, we've been we've had Narcan kits for the last, I think, at least 10 years. And now I believe um, we're working on getting xylazine test kits um, as well. So we're pretty big on harm reduction. And I, I uh, it's one of the reasons why I love working there. Awesome. Awesome. Definitely. I think that um, Oasis is doing some work around um, making xylanine test strips more available. So you definitely want to check with them as well. Um, and I think uh, Samsha might be, Samsa might be doing something as well with that. So you might want to definitely check in with that. Um, so I'm going to move us forward because we still have some things that we're going to work on. Okay. I'm going to call out the person who I see in front of me, who is Deborah. Okay, Deborah is the one. Is that Deborah? Yes, Deborah is the one who is doing all the head nodding for you guys. Okay, so she's head nodding, letting me know, go, go. Okay, so appreciate that, Deborah. So I have me... a question. Just what's the name of the law or the organization that was mentioned earlier that you can get your mm -hmm. less is more. Okay, it's called the Less Is More Act. Okay. All right. So give me one second. So harm reduction with justice involved clients, the practicalities, okay? So one of the things we need to be very thoughtful around is who plays what role, okay? Who plays what role? We know as the treatment provider, we play a particular role and the mandated entity plays a particular role. Now, while we're talking about justice involved clients, <clears throat> excuse me, just remembering that mandating entities, okay, do not necessarily have to be justice involved folks because we know that ACS has the ability to mandate folks, employers, et cetera. So we wanna be, a, be respectful of that. But there are very clear roles on who plays what role, right? So the treatment provider provides um, care consistent with the knowledge in the field, identify goals, develops a plan, encourages support, et cetera, and listens with compassion. And there are a number of tasks that are connected to the treatment provider. 
The mandated entity obtains agreement on the responsibility and tasks to be achieved, encourages and support, and monitors compliance and agreement to encourage success and to support public and family safety, right? So we have to look at who plays what role and recognizing that we stay within our role. There is advocacy on both sides, but remembering that there are very clear boundaries on what our role is and what our role is not. And that is key, okay? So when we talk about the lines of team communication, one of the things I'm advocating for or advocate in this space or in this space is that rather than separating probation and parole outside as a entity that's outside that has the ability to impact our clients, rather than let's talk about engaging them in the process, engaging them in the process. Now in the courts, this is a little easier because courts will do a referral to someone or a referral to a program. And so there is that continued involvement through court reports, et cetera. But probation and parole can be a little bit trickier, okay? You know, and, and that's just the nature of whether or not someone reports once a month, et cetera. So when we are engaging folks who are involved in the justice um, system, how about really talking to the mandated entity, of course, with the permission of the person who is in the middle, who is a client, okay? So having those lines of communication is incredibly important from the very beginning, okay? And so really what we're leaning into is of course, providing the psychoeducation around harm reduction. Okay, what that looks like, talking about that harm reduction spectrum, what harm reduction is or is not, and providing that psychoeducation to both the client and the mandating entity. But also what we're looking at is, you know, we have to address, is there a goal alignment, right? So many times if a client is involved with, let's say probation and parole, the courts, one of the key goals is I just want them out of my life. I want to meet the mandate and I just want to get through this. And so, yes, that is one of the ultimate goals that folks may have, but what are the other goals that they may have? And when we think about all of this, are the client's goals consistent with the expectations of the goals and mandated entity? And what are the client's goals in regard to the mandate? And how do we reconcile those differences? And so remember a little earlier when I talked about this, you know, having those conversations with clients, having the conversations with the mandated entity is not a one-time thing. This is something that needs to be consistent throughout the treatment process. And for some folks, it may feel very challenging. And for some folks, it's not organic to include parole offices and probation offices in these conversations but it is incredibly helpful. I will say that your best efforts, um, hopefully they're responded to because I have seen times where folks or clinicians or providers are reaching out to mandated entities and may have some challenges around getting back to folk or involving folks in case conferences, et cetera. So really trying to do this in as helpful way as possible um, but with the recognition that folks may not be responsive and or they may take their time responding, okay? So the goals of the client and the mandating entity, um, really thinking about any potential incongruence. So how does the client understand the consequences of noncompliance with the mandated expectations and how best to reconcile the differences? Anytime I have ever worked with anyone who is involved in any of the justice involved spaces, whether probation, parole, court, et cetera, one of the first conversation I have with them is around what this mandate is. What does it look like? Um, how do they feel that they are able to hopefully be successful in it, et cetera? Having those conversations is key, okay? And what the consequences could potentially be. You know, we really need to have those very real conversations with folk, okay? And having those conversations being transparent and including the mandated entity as much as possible and with the client's agreement. We also wanna think about treatment team goals and I'm utilizing the word team for a very specific purpose. The mandating entity 
whomever it can be or whoever it is, can be a part of the team, okay? Can be a part of the team. Part of our ability is to reach out and to include them as a part of the team with the understanding that the client themselves needs to agree to this, okay? If the client does not agree, does not want the parole or probation officer included, then that is something that we need to consider. Also, when we think about court reports, et cetera, how does all of this come into play, come into the room in regards to our ongoing treatment with a client? These are all considerations that we need to think about, okay? So treatment team goal is treatment provider goals are improvement in life situation and reduced impact from substance use. And mandated entity goals can include improvement in life situation, reduce substance use um, disorder impact on the life, usually abstinence, but when you think about reduction, that leaves that opening for us to do more and in regards to harm reduction. Definitely mandating entities um, do not necessarily want the person or persons to be involved in the more illegal activity that brings them back into the justice system in another way, charge, et cetera. Protecting public and family safety and really honestly keeping people out of jail. That's really some of the concrete goals of the mandating entity. And so we now come to a space where let's put this all together. Let's, let's pull it all together. And so what we're going to be doing is doing a case scenario, okay? And I'm going to put up the case scenario and you will actually be participating in groups in your learning spaces to process the case scenario, okay? And so, this is our case scenario that you'll be working on as our groups are being formed. Anthony agrees to be part of an ATI program to engage in treatment to avoid jail. As a part of his conditional release, he agrees to abstain from alcohol and other substances. And we know that when people initially agree to avoid jail time or prison time, et cetera, that folks are in a very vulnerable place. And so they may agree to things to avoid being incarcerated, okay? So he agrees to abstain from alcohol and other substances. He's agreed to a treatment mandate, which includes toxicologies. And we need to know and recognize that based upon the OASIS regulations, that toxicologies are something that we need to discuss with a mandating entity, okay? He attends treatment as scheduled and acknowledges that he has been using substances intermittently. He asks that you keep this information to yourself as he does not want to get in trouble with the course, courts. And when asked, he states that he confided this information to you because he worries that he will eventually be caught and sent to jail and he wants to take this more seriously. Okay. So I'm going to ask, hopefully, that our, our group's ready. I'm going to stop my share because it will be up during your um, groups. And so, so you will be moved into five, there'll be five rooms that you'll be processing Anthony's case. You'll be identifying the challenges, um, the potential challenges in regards to harm reduction. You'll be identifying the potential challenges of him asking you not to share this information with the courts, all of that, okay? And so you will have approximately 20 minutes for this exercise. Please remember which room you are going into. And I ask that each room designate one person to report back to the larger group their process of Anthony's case. Okay, is everyone clear? Okay, so we're ready for our rooms. You should begin to see your room assignments opening now. And remember, Anthony's case will be posted during your scenario um, review. Okay, so let's get started with the report outs. What were some of the things that resonated for you in that case study um, as it relates to harm reduction, et cetera, and justice involvement? 
So I'm going to move to group one. Um, would you like to start us off? So, so um, if I'm in group one, my name is Brenda Oscar. I think I was in group one. Brenda Oscar. Brenda Oscar. Linda. Brenda. Brenda. Yes, you were in group one. Okay. So um, Ida and I were talking about the case. Mm -hmm. And we talked about um, not being not having the ability to hold the person secret in as much as he's being honest and he's um, you know, being forthright. At the same time, we have a responsibility as um, you know, providers. Um, we talked about um asking, like, what would happen if he continued to use in the long run? Maybe he can come up with some of those answers on his own. We talked about using um MI to kind of help him pinpoint like the source and consequences of um his choices. Mm -hmm. Um and just not enabling enabling someone, you know. Um Ida spoke about when she's faced with those situations, she explained to the person, like we work as a team, and as a team, we informed each other. It's 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 better for him in the long run, treatment wise, to get his needs met. So those are the, some of the things that um, she and I talked about. Sounds good. Thank you. I am just, I just went off screen for a minute because I just realized I did not plug my computer up and I will lose power in like two minutes. Um, let's move to group two. And group two had Angela, Deanna, and Elizabeth. I can report out for group two. Um, I took some notes. Yep. Uh, so first and foremost, we said it should not be confidential. Uh, we discussed that hopefully before the treatment process started, there was a conversation and a consent to treatment uh, where we discussed what uh, our roles and responsibilities were, who would be talking to, um, if this is a team approach, what are the role of the team members? Uh, there was a discussion about some people being possibly hesitant to, re to report uh, as a person of color, uh, recognizing that sometimes you just can't get a break from the system. Uh, we talked about this opening the door for a conversation about him wanting to take it more seriously. Uh, how can he be accountable for his goals? Um, and ultimately, from a harm reduction standpoint, that a return to use doesn't mean that I'm not taking it seriously. Asking him the question, what does it mean when you say, I'll take it more seriously? Um, and really recognizing, do I have the skills or the resources to be successful in my goals? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what about just if it's okay if I ask a question? Yeah. What about um, the courts and having the conversation around harm reduction? Um, because there seems to be a great deal of fear about what will happen if he's discovered. Right. And for that, I don't know that we as a team discuss that. Speaking for myself, if I'm operating from a team standpoint, I'm hoping this is a discussion that is happened within the team and I personally believe as much as possible with my client let's have this conversation together with the courts or if you're reporting and that these are your concerns mm -hmm. and this is what you would like and asking the team for their support you know what else can I do this is where I'm struggling right yeah. right and I think that that's and, and that's the point I wanted to bring us full circle in that for some of us, sometimes having those conversations, being hesitant to have the conversations with a mandated entity, whether it's court, probation, and parole, that sometimes we miss opportunities to advocate for our clients. Um, definitely with all of the client, you know, with the client considering, you know, considering their comfortability with us having that conversation, right? That's one piece. The other piece is, is having that conversation with the client in the space, okay? Not a separate conversation, um, not a report that's done without the client knowing. It's about having that conversation where everyone's hearing the information, everyone is operating from the same space, 
and that advocacy and if, if it's present pushback, it can all be addressed and everyone is transparent in what that looks like. Because ultimately at the end, it's the client who may run into some challenges if we are put in a position where, you know, folks don't know what's going on. Okay. And that's something we also need to talk with clients as well. If, if you don't want that information to be shared, let's also talk about what not sharing or how not sharing that information may also impact your case, um, your um, interactions with parole, et cetera. Again, constantly having those transparent, inclusive conversations. Um, did you want to say something, Elizabeth? Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, because it sounded like somebody unmuted themselves. Okay, awesome. Let's move to group three. Okay. So they volunteered me to speak for group three. Uh, there was no autonomy there. It was like, here, you go. <laughs> um, so first of all, we started off with asking the client, what does um, wanting to take this more seriously mean to them? And then uh, we'll, whatever the client stayed, then we want to talk about his being honest to us honest with us and how important it is to be honest with us and the fact that we may need to call his probation officer to find out what he's what does um I can't remember the whole scenario what shoot does not mean taking drugs consist of or if it's okay for us to do an intermediate and check his levels. We thought it was very important for us to focus on his levels whenever we're talking about him still using and maybe we can talk to being his advocate and talk to his probation officer to monitor his, his levels and as long as it's going down, he is doing his best. He is uh, making progress with his levels going down. So, and that's what we wanted to focus mostly on with his levels going down, he's making progress and to make sure that's okay with the rest of the team. Uh, uh, and I, and I, like the, I like the discussion, like having the discussion, what does this mean, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, because we know that sometimes folks, we and not even sometimes, we know that anyone who is potentially involved in the justice system has a great deal of fear about what will happen if I don't do this, right? That's a very real fear. And so being an advocate, having the conversation, engaging the mandated entity versus treating them as an outsider is a way to address some of that. It's a way to address a lot of it, okay? Because many times, you know, folk, um, you know, folks, probation officer, parole officer, courts, your reputation is key, right. right? Your reputation is key. And if you have a good reputation for being transparent and being connected with folk, they will work with you in regards to clients. They will work with you in regards to clients. So it's something that we really need to consider, um, and for those who may be hesitant around how do I report this? How do I have that conversation? Because we also have to recognize within justice involved that space, there's conversation, there's, there's terminology, there's things that we want to um, prepare ourselves for to have that conversation. You don't have to do that alone. You can actually talk with your supervisor, talk with the director, et cetera. Or if you have a court liaison or someone else who may be more, um, who feels more confident, you can engage them as well as a part of this process to help you have those conversations. Did you have anything else? I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to group four. Okay. I'll speak for group four. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we said a lot of the same things that everybody else did. We talked about 
um, you know, the challenges around Anthony not, you know, fully understanding that, um, uh, that, you know, he, that, that, you know, the culture of corrections has been to punish. And certainly Anthony is afraid of that, just like you talked about. I was really encouraged, though, to hear um, some of the courts in New York uh, right now um, are not incarcerating for use. You know, they're really working with folks. And I think that we have an obligation to educate our clients about harm reduction and, um, and also to educate the criminal justice system, depending on where they're at with that. So, you know, we, we pretty much had the, the same conversation that, you know, to really be talking to Anthony about that and to um, be his advocate and hopefully work towards um, him disclosing the information and being with him when he does that and having much more of a team approach and, you know, recognizing that um, he's working towards his goals and we're, you know, we're behind him. And, um, you know, we could help support him and be his advocate. Thank you. You know, I, as much as, first of all, I hope you folks are getting the sense that I'm super passionate about this. I actually, actually I did my whole dissertation on, on connecting with justice involved clients and um, the, you know, what that looks like. And in all honesty, you know, it's amazing. Yes, there's times where it can be very challenging having conversations with courts and probation and parole around um, treatment and treatment approaches and clients' progress, et cetera. But there's also amazing conversations that are to be had. Um, again, one of the things I advocate for is when that person initially begins treatment, having the conversation with the parole office or probation officer or the courts, having the conversation with the client around what harm reduction is um, and really kind of starting from the very beginning and continuing to revisit that is a way to address some of these challenges before they come up, okay? Before they come up. And again, you know, we are going to have to be respectful of clients' level of comfort around having those conversations I've had clients who were very comfortable with me talking with probation and parole in the courts and some who was like, no, don't share any information with them. And I did have to have that conversation around if there is no information sharing, what does that look like for you? Okay. So thank you for that. Um, let's go to group five. Let me see who was in group five. Hi, it's Miss Davis, Eula Davis. I was in group five. Awesome. Um, we pretty much had the same views um, and everything that was spoken already, you know, there was nothing else that we could say. Um, our biggest thing was uh, teaching the guy how to be honest. You know, that's what he really has to learn first and foremost, you know, the harm reduction and everything else will come behind it. But honesty is going to have to be first. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, and being respectful of where, you know, I, I wanted to circle back to being respectful of, yes, transparency is important, but also exploring the options of what transparency means. Okay, so we need to be able to talk about all of the potential challenges that may arise from being honest, right? And and, and really being transparent. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so very much. I, I hope that folks found this exercise a bit helpful in really beginning to unpack some of this and the different moving pieces, whether it is the client understanding of what harm reduction is, right? Because while we're utilizing the approach, we also need to educate our clients continuously about what that means. Also talking with, with the client's um, understanding and permission, talking with the mandated entity, educating them around harm reduction, engaging them around the consequences, if there would be any consequences, et cetera. This is all that team approach. And really what we're talking about is expanding your team, expanding your team. 
And as providers, sometimes we really, really struggle with that. Okay, because, you know, justice involvement or justice systems in many ways have been the complete antithesis of what we do as providers. Okay, and in order to bridge that gap, we need to take an active role in helping to bridge that gap. Okay, because in the middle are our clients. Okay, so I'm gonna share a little bit more information. I know we're winding down and thank you for that. So hold on one second, let me share my screen. And kind of thinking about some of this, the challenges to harm reduction integration are some of the things that came out in the case scenario. So one of the things we need to really lean into is a lack of clarity around the treatment mandates between the client and, and team members. A part of our um, role as treatment providers is to really be clear about what the mandates look like, okay? What the mandates look like and being clear about the moving pieces around that so that we can continue to advocate and educate the client around the treatment mandates. We also want to be you know, connected to regulatory, mandatory, and program incongruence, right? So we can have clients who come in who are involved in the justice system in a variety of different ways, and the mandate that they have is completely incongruent to the program. Okay, we have folks who come in who are mandated to attend our program for nine months and in six months or three months, they've done very well and met the treatment goals that were determined in the program. And so we really have to figure out a way to manage that and have those conversations. Also regulatory. While we think about OASIS programs and OASIS determines in many ways what we do within our programs, is there always communication between our accrediting bodies, whether it's OASIS, OMH, et cetera, and the court system and probation and parole? Someone mentioned a little while ago that they're going to be having a meeting with probation and parole. Those are key steps in providing that education, okay? Jasmine, you have your hand raised. Jasmine? Sorry, I was trying to figure out how to unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely can hear you. Okay. <laughs> um, I just thought of something that you had mentioned uh, when you were talking about like the, uh, you know, 60, 90 day mandates. I used to work at um, an inpatient program. And one of the things uh, we would have a lot is 28 day mandates. And um, over time, probation and parole we're able to work with us with understanding that we don't have a lot of housing in our community. And if we got someone a bed at a long-term facility or even a shelter, you know, like the YMCA or YWCA probation ended up working with us a lot. If, you know, it was 21 or excuse me, 21 days that we got that bed as opposed to 28 days because probation understood that that bed not, might not be available, you know, once it hits 28 days. So I just wanted to share that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And again, we go back to there's a lot of headway being made in a lot of conversations. And so continuing those conversations. But the thing is, having the conversations in the first place, right? Having the conversations in the first place. We are definitely making headway. While we still have a long way to go, we still are definitely making headway. So thank you for that. We also want to recognize that there may be potentially challenges in the bi-directional communication between programs and the mandating entity. Um, sometimes it can be really challenging for folks may not feel comfortable in talking to the mandated entity, especially if the client has given that permission to do so in talking to the mandated entity, what to report, what doesn't need to be reported, et cetera. And so really being clear about what that looks like is incredibly important. Also, who on the team is going to communicate with the court or have that direct communication with the probation or parole officer? In many times or in many ways, it would be the primary counselor or the primary provider who would have that communication, but with the input from the team. Okay, so really kind of figuring that out. 
also the recognition that, again, and it's something I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we may be making our best efforts to communicate with the mandating entities such as the courts. Um, and the courts are pretty, a, a little easier because you know folks have court dates and we do court reports, et cetera, but probation and parole, we may be reaching out to that person. We may be attempting to contact them to do the education around harm reduction, have that case conference with the client present so we can all understand the mandate, et cetera. Um, we may be sending emails, et cetera, and that person may not, um, may not respond. One of the ways that I found that was super helpful in kind of helping to move that process along when I found that that was happening is asking the client if they felt okay with the next time they reported to probation or parole to contact me when we had that, when they're in the office. Yeah. That's another way to over kind of, um, to compensate for that challenge, those challenges between bi-directional communication. Sound like someone unmuted themselves. I wanted to give them space. So the other thing is client and mandating entity challenges in understanding harm reduction. Okay, understanding harm reduction. While we've made a great deal of headway in regards to the proliferation of um, harm reduction information, et cetera, it's really leaning into the moving pieces as it relates to harm reduction. Okay, talking with clients ongoing about what harm reduction is and isn't talking with mandated entities around harm reduction, what it is and isn't, and, and, and being able to answer the questions, okay? Because folks do have questions. Folks do have some thoughts around harm reduction and really de deconstructing the stigma and, and being open about what harm reduction is and isn't for both clients and for the mandating entity is a key um, component of this work, okay? So some of the benefits of harm reduction is acknowledging that stopping drug use may not be realistic or desirable for everyone and respecting that folks come at this in a very different way or, you know, different, they come into different spaces and being respectful of that. It really provides practical strategies for reducing risk and harms. And while we today have talked about substance use, the recognition that harm reduction is something that we are all engaged in in a variety of different ways. And I would suggest when you're talking with the mandated entities and talking about harm reduction, using those very practical, ex practical examples of harm reduction. Harm reduction is seat belts. Harm reduction is decrease of sugar. Harm reduction is and you can kind of fill in the blanks with what examples might be helpful because sometimes just connecting that information for folks that everyone is engaged in some form of harm reduction goes a bit of a way of deconstructing the stigmas around harm reduction. We also wanna recognize that no person should be denied access to services because of their drug use, okay? It balances costs and benefits also providing accurate information about what harm reduction is and is not. Attempts to promote and facilitate access for the care for drug misuse and mental health um, challenges and engages drug users in a continuum of care from which they would otherwise be excluded, okay? There's a recognition that not abstinence is not for everyone and safer use or reduction of use is a part of the continuum of care that our clients can be involved in, regardless as to whether they are in justice, they are involved in the justice system or not, okay? So this kind of brings us to our closure. And here are some harm reduction resources that you can feel free to utilize as you expand how you're going to present harm reduction or continue to present harm reduction to your staff, to clients, to mandating entities. Um, and this is just a few of the sites that you can utilize. Um, some other folks have been putting some information in the um, chat around some other resources that you can utilize, okay? There's some references that you can also look at. And so I wanted to open it up to any feedback or questions before we begin our closure for today. So I'm gonna stop my share. Um, Jasmine, is your hand still raised or did you have more feedback? We have feedback or a question? 
Sorry, I forgot to put my uh, hand raised down. I don't have any more feedback or questions. Okay, no worries. Um, I see Chelsea. Yes, I talked a little about in the breakout room about um, the difficulty in the with harm reduction in the court system is that it's hard to standardize laws um, regarding harm reduction. So do you see any uh, availability in the future to have like a best practices manual for, you know, court system, the court system regarding like how to how to help people who are in the court system? Mm -hmm. I think that eventually OASIS will be looking at some best practices in regards to this because they, there's been a lot of um, resources put into harm reduction and resources put into educating har around harm reduction. I suspect that that is something that is going to come up in, in some time, definitely. Um, I think it's needed. It definitely is needed. I think that there's a lot of peripheral conversation, a lot of peripheral documentation around how to engage justice involved folks, but we definitely need something in regards to best practices specifically focused on harm reduction and justice involved individuals, okay? But I will definitely take your suggestion back um, to see where that lands. If there is, is that out there? I think folks are just at the point right now where they're like, let's, you know, let's really get edu folks educated around harm reduction as best we can, and then we'll begin to lean into special populations. Okay. But that also doesn't hurt to also join one of the harm reduction office hours that offer through OASIS and ask the question. I think it'd also be interesting to, within the, the best practices, to include stuff like implicit bias um mm -hmm. yeah that kind of stuff um as well I, I think that would be really neat to see how they they would create back best practices in general mm -hmm. excellent i will definitely put that bug in someone's ear okay other feedback or questions make sure i'm not missing anybody Okay, I'm not, looks like I'm not missing anyone. So if you at any point have any feedback or questions, you'll have access to, um, on my last slide. I have, I think I have my email on the last slide. You can feel free to email me at a later date. Um, if you have any questions, et cetera, or you'd like further information. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen Hold on one second. Hold on. Thank you for being a part of our learning community today. It was a an, an very interesting and insightful conversation. Also, you may um, feel free to utilize my email to ask any questions and or if there's anything that you'd like to see in regards to future webinars, et cetera, in the learning community. I'd like to thank everyone for participating today. It was very much appreciated and please have a great rest of the day.